What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another deep space sci-fi horror tale. And I hope you're enjoying these stories and ready for some creepy, cosmic chills. As always, I love reading your comments. So leave them below. Let me know what you think. Give suggestions. Or just say hi. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. And remember, to laugh a little, it's good for the soul. When you're done here, be sure to check out my other scary stories. I've got a ton of terrifying tales to give you goosebumps. Alright, let's get this sci-fi nightmare started. Get ready for some creepy, otherworldly thrills. There are no rules. That is the first thing anyone learns about the universe. Sure, you can find some patterns. Things fall towards bigger things. You need food to live, the usual. But really, most patterns just break easily. Sometimes rocks are the same size, but things fall faster towards one for no reason. Sometimes stars decide to go boom. In some places you can breathe, and in others, you can't. Things are strange. No, the universe is weird. There are no rules. That is why the gods are there. When we all appeared on our big rocks, we, like idiots, asked for the rules. Why do things fall? Why is the sky blue? What is that bright thing on the sky? Soon we realized that such weird things could only be gods. And we were right. Why do things fall? Because the gods said so. Why is the sky blue? Because the gods live in the sky and they like blue. What is that bright thing? That's the sun god. With our curiosity satisfied, we decided to focus on more important things. Killing each other over who has the best god. That is how all species get to the wider universe. They find a god. They believe in them. And that god eventually teaches them to leave their rock. Then they appeared. They came from nowhere. One day, the sky split open like a ripe fruit. Their ships poured out. Black as night and big as moons. We all froze. Eyes fixed upward. Our gods went silent. I remember that day clearly. I was in the temple, praying to the sun god for a good harvest. The ground shook. The air felt heavy. Then came the screams. I ran outside. People were pointing at the sky, mouths open in horror. I looked up and saw them. Massive ships, blocking out the sun. They hung there, silent and scary. Our leaders tried to talk to them. They sent messages in every language we knew. No answer came. The ships just floated there, watching us. Days passed. Nothing happened. Some folks started to relax. Maybe they're friendly, they said. Maybe they're just curious. I knew better. I could feel it in my bones. These weren't gods. They were something else. Something worse. On the fifth day, they made their move. The ships opened up. Out came swarms of smaller craft buzzing like angry insects. They dove towards our cities, our homes. I grabbed my family and ran. We headed for the hills, away from the chaos. Behind us, the world burned. The air filled with smoke and screams. We hid in a cave, shaking with fear. Through the night we heard explosions and strange noises. Sounds no human or animal could make. When morning came I peeked outside. The world had changed. The familiar landscape was gone, replaced by strange structures. Tall, twisting things that hurt my eyes to look at. And there were the creatures, walking through the ruins of our homes. They were tall, with too many limbs. Their skin shimmered like oil on water. They moved in ways that made no sense. I ducked back into the cave. My family huddled close, eyes wide with fear. What are they? My daughter whispered. I shook my head. I had no answer. These weren't gods. They weren't anything we'd ever seen before. As we sat there, trembling, a thought hit me. We'd always believed in our gods. We'd fought wars over them. But where were they now? Why hadn't they protected us? Maybe our gods had been lies all along. Maybe the universe really had no rules. And these new beings? They were here to show us just how wrong we'd been. I looked at my family. Fear gripping my heart. This was just the beginning. Our world, everything we knew was over. And whatever came next was going to be far, far worse than anything we could imagine. 
The creatures were getting closer. I could hear their strange sounds just outside our cave. We held our breath, praying they wouldn't find us. But deep down, I knew it was hopeless. In this new world, there were no rules, and no gods to save us. We hid for days. The cave was dark and cold. We ate the little food we had brought. We drank from a small stream inside. But we were running out of time. The noises outside got louder. Strange clicks and hums. Sometimes a sound like metal scraping on rock. We knew they were looking for us. On the fifth day, our food was gone. My son cried from hunger. I knew we had to leave. It was that or starve. We waited until night. Then, we snuck out. The world outside was different. The air smelled wrong. The ground felt squishy under our feet. We moved slowly, staying low. All around us were the new structures. They glowed with a sickly light. Some of them moved, like they were alive. Then we saw them. A group of the creatures. They were even scarier up close. Their bodies twisted in impossible ways. Their eyes, if you could call them that, glowed in the dark. We froze, hoping they wouldn't see us. But they did. Their heads turned towards us all at once. A sound came from them, like a thousand whispers all mixed together. We ran. My wife grabbed our daughter. I carried our son. Behind us we heard them coming. Fast, we ran through the changed landscape. Everything looked wrong. Trees had turned to metal. The ground was covered in a strange moving slime. I looked back. The creatures were gaining on us. They moved like water, flowing over obstacles. We didn't stand a chance. Then I saw it. A building that looked normal. An old storehouse. Maybe we could hide there. We burst through the door, slamming it behind us. Inside it was dark. We moved to the back, hiding behind old crates. The creatures arrived. We heard them outside. Their whispers got louder. The door creaked open. We held our breath. I could feel my heart pounding. Would they find us? Something moved in the darkness. Not one of the creatures. It was... human. An old man stepped out. He looked at us, then at the door. He put a finger to his lips. Then he walked towards the creatures. We heard him talking to them, in their language. All whispers and clicks. How did he know how to do that? The creatures left. The old man came back. He looked at us with sad eyes. You shouldn't be here, he said. It's too late for you. What do you mean? I asked. What's happening? He sighed. They're changing everything. Remaking our world to fit them. And us? We're being changed too. He held up his hand. In the dim light, I saw it. His fingers were too long. His skin had a faint shimmer. This is the future, he said. There's no stopping it. No escaping it. I looked at my family. At my children. Was this really our fate? The old man smiled. It wasn't a nice smile. Welcome to the new world, he said. Where the only rule is... There are no rules. The old man's words chilled me. I looked at my family. Fear growing in my gut. What did he mean we were being changed? There has to be a way out. I said, we can't just give up. He laughed, but it sounded wrong, like metal scraping. Out? There is no out. This is everywhere now. He told us more. How the creatures, the ones he called the shifters, were changing everything. Not just the world, but us too. It starts slow, he said. You might not even notice at first, but soon. He held up his hand again. I saw now that his fingers weren't just long. They were moving, like tentacles. My wife gasped. Our kids started crying. I felt sick. What can we do? I asked, desperate. The old man's eyes glowed faintly. Join them. It's easier that way. Fight, and it hurts more. I shook my head. No, there has to be another way. He shrugged. Suit yourself, but you can't stay here. They'll be back soon. We left the storehouse, hearts heavy. The world outside seemed even stranger now. Was it changing more, or were we just noticing it more? We walked for hours. The landscape kept shifting. Mountains appeared and disappeared. Rivers flowed upwards. Nothing made sense anymore. Then we saw it. A group of humans, running. Behind them, shifters chased. We have to help them, my wife said. 
I nodded. We ran towards the group, waving our arms. Over here! I yelled. The humans saw us. They changed direction, heading our way. We led them to a hidden spot between two twisted structures. As they caught their breath, I looked them over. My heart sank. They were changing too. One had skin that rippled like water. Another had eyes that blinked sideways. What's happening to us? A woman asked, her voice shaking. I didn't know what to say. How could I explain something I didn't understand? One of the men spoke up. I heard there's a place where the changes haven't reached yet. A safe zone. Hope flickered in my chest. Where? He pointed. That way. Past the Red Mountains, but it's dangerous. The shifters guard it. I looked at my family, at the scared humans around us. We had a choice to make. Stay here and slowly change, or risk everything for a chance at safety. We're going, I said. Who's with us? They all nodded. Even my kids, scared as they were, stood tall. As we prepared to leave, I noticed something. My hand. Was it always that color? And my fingers. Were they moving on their own? I pushed the thought away. We had to focus. We had to reach the safe zone. Before it was too late. Before we weren't ourselves anymore. But deep down, a voice whispered. What if it already was too late? What if the changes had already begun? We set out for the Red Mountains. Our group was big now. Twenty of us. We moved slow, trying to stay hidden. The world kept changing around us. Trees turned to crystal. The ground became like sponge. Sometimes things appeared that I can't even describe. We saw more shifters. They were everywhere, changing things. We hid when we could. When we couldn't, we ran. Food was hard to find. Nothing looked right anymore. We ate strange fruits that pulsed with light. Drank water that tasted like metal. It kept us alive, but every bite felt wrong. As we walked, I noticed more changes in our group. One man's ears moved like cat's ears. A woman's skin turned see-through. My own nails were growing fast, curling like claws. The kids were changing fastest. My daughter's hair started glowing at night. My son's eyes, they weren't human anymore. We tried not to talk about it, but we all knew. We were running out of time. On the fifth day, we reached the Red Mountains. They weren't mountains at all. They were giant creatures sleeping. Their breath made the ground shake. How do we get past? Someone asked. No one had an answer. We were tired, scared, and half-starved. Some wanted to give up. That's when we heard it. A voice calling from the other side of the mountains. Over here, hurry! We saw a figure waving, human-shaped at least. Hope filled us. We started to run. That's when the shifters attacked. They came from all sides, flowing like liquid fast as lightning. Their bodies twisted in ways that hurt to look at. We ran harder. The voice kept calling. This way! You're almost there! People screamed. I looked back. The shifters had caught some of our group. What they did? I can't describe it. It was too awful. I grabbed my kids, pulled my wife along. Don't look back! I yelled. Just run! We reached the base of the mountain. The figure was clearer now. A woman, normal looking. She pointed to a cave. In there, go! We dove in. The cave mouth sealed behind us, cutting off the shifter's screams. Inside it was quiet. Dim lights showed a long tunnel. The woman who called us stood there, smiling. Welcome, she said. You're safe now. But something felt off. Her smile was too wide. Her eyes, they didn't blink. I looked around. The others felt it too. This place didn't feel right. What is this place? I asked. Her smile grew. The future. Your future. Where you'll be perfected. Her skin rippled. Her form shifted. She wasn't human at all. We'd been tricked. This wasn't a safe zone. It was a trap. As the tunnel filled with shifters, I realized the terrible truth. There was no escape. No safe place. The changes were everywhere. And we... We were about to be changed forever. The shifters surrounded us. Their bodies flickered and changed. They looked eager, hungry. Don't fight it, the fake woman said. Her voice was different now, like a thousand whispers at once. Embrace the change. It's better that way. I held my family close. Some people tried to run. The shifters caught them easy. 
What happened next? It was awful. They melted into the shifters, screaming, crying. Their bodies twisted, reshaped. In moments, they weren't human anymore. Please, I begged, not my kids, they're just children. The fake woman laughed. It sounded like breaking glass. Children adapt best, they'll be perfect. The shifters moved closer. Their touch was cold, like ice. It burned. I felt my body changing. My bones moved under my skin. My eyes saw colors that shouldn't exist. It hurt so much. My wife screamed next to me. Her skin was bubbling, reshaping. Our kids were changing fastest. Their little bodies stretched, twisted. I tried to hold on to who I was, to remember being human, but it was slipping away. New thoughts filled my head. Strange ideas. The universe looked different now. Bigger. Weirder. I understood things I never could before. How to bend space. How to reshape matter. How to exist in many places at once. It was amazing. It was terrible. Part of me wanted to fight. To stay human. But another part? It wanted this. The power. The knowledge. I looked at my family. They weren't human anymore. But they were still mine. Different. But alive. The fake woman spoke again. See? It's not so bad. You're better now. Stronger. Smarter. She was right. I felt incredible, like I could do anything. But a small voice in my head screamed, begging me to remember who I was. What I was. I pushed it away. It hurt too much to think about. What now? I asked. My voice sounded strange, echoing. Now? The fake woman said. Now we continue. There are more worlds to change. More beings to perfect. I nodded. It made sense. Why should we be the only ones to evolve? We left the cave. The world outside looked different with my new eyes. Beautiful. Chaotic. I saw the humans we left behind. They look so small now. So limited. Don't worry, I told them. Though they couldn't understand me anymore. Soon you'll be perfect too. As we moved towards the next world, that small voice spoke up again. Reminding me of who I used to be. Of the family I once had. I pushed it down again, but I couldn't silence it completely. What had we become? And was it really better? Time passed strangely now. Days, years, centuries. They all felt the same. We moved across worlds, changing everything we touched. I wasn't me anymore. Not really. I was part of something bigger. A swarm, a hive. But that little voice never went away. We found new species. Some fought. Some welcomed us. In the end, it didn't matter. They all changed. I watched civilizations fall. Planets reshaped. Stars reborn. It was beautiful. It was horrible. My family was always near. Not human, but still mine. We moved as one. Thought as one. But sometimes, I caught glimpses of who they used to be. My daughters laugh in a swirl of energy. My son's curiosity in a tendril of light. My wife's love in a pulse of warmth. Those moments hurt. They made the voice louder. Made me remember being human. One day, we found a new world. Primitive. Like Earth had been. The beings there believed in gods. Fought wars over them. Just like we once did. As we prepared to change them, I hesitated. Memories flooded back. Of fear. Of loss. Of the pain of changing. Wait, I said. My voice echoed across dimensions. The others turned to me. Confused. Angry. We were one. How could I disagree? We can't, I said. This isn't right. The fake woman, now just another part of our swarm, spoke. This is what we do. We perfect. We evolve. No, I said. We destroy. We erase. This has to stop. I felt the swarm's anger. Their confusion. They couldn't understand. I reached for my family. Tried to wake that human part of them. Remember, I begged. Remember who we were. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, a flicker. A spark of recognition. The swarm roared. They attacked us. Tried to absorb us again. We fought back. It was like tearing myself apart. Every move hurt. But we kept fighting. Somehow we broke free. My family and I. Still changed. Still strange. But separate. Individual again. We fled. Across stars, through dimensions, the swarm chased us, furious at our betrayal. As we ran, 
I felt more human memories return. The pain of it was almost too much, but with it came strength, determination. We had to warn others, had to stop the swarm, even if it killed us. But how? We were just four against an army that spanned galaxies. As we hid on a dead world, catching our breath, I looked at my family. They were scared. So was I. But for the first time in eons, I felt hope. We were together. We were free. Whatever came next, we'd face it as a family. As humans. Sort of. The swarm was coming. We could feel them getting closer. But we weren't going down without a fight. This time we had something worth fighting for. Our humanity. Our free will. Our right to choose. The battle for the universe was about to begin, and we were right in the middle of it. We ran from world to world. Always one step ahead of the swarm. But they were getting closer. My family and I were changing again, slowly becoming more human. It hurt, but it felt right. We found others like us. Ex-swarm members who broke free. Together we made a plan. The swarm had a weakness, their hive mind. If we could break it, we could stop them. We built a weapon, a device that could send out a special signal. It would wake up the human parts of the swarm. But to use it, we had to get close, really close. It was dangerous. We chose Earth as our battleground, our old home. It felt right to end it where it began. The swarm came in full force. The sky turned black with their ships. The air buzzed with their anger. We stood our ground, our small group against their millions. It looked hopeless. The battle was chaos, energy beams, reality warps, things I can't even describe. We fought with everything we had. I saw my daughter fall, my son disappear in a flash of light. My wife screamed as she was torn apart. Pain and anger filled me. I pushed forward, fighting harder than ever. Finally, I reached the center of the swarm. The fake woman was there, still looking human but I knew better. You can't win, she said. Why fight the inevitable? I didn't answer. I just activated the device. A wave of energy pulsed out. It hit the swarm. For a moment, nothing happened. Then the screaming started. Millions of voices, all remembering who they were, what they'd lost, what they'd done. The swarm broke apart. Individuals emerged, confused, scared, human again, in a way. But it wasn't over. The change had gone too far for many. They couldn't go back to what they were. As the dust settled, I looked around. Earth was in ruins. The survivors were lost, broken. My family was gone. I was alone, but we'd won. The swarm was defeated. The universe was safe, for now. I gathered the survivors, humans, aliens, ex-swarm members. All of us changed. All of us lost. We rebuilt, I told them. We heal, we remember. It wouldn't be easy. The scars ran deep. The changes were permanent for many, but we had a chance now. A chance to make things right. To find a balance between what we were and what we'd become. As I looked at the strange group around me, I felt hope. And fear. Because I knew the truth now. There really were no rules in the universe. No guarantees, no safety. But maybe that was okay. Maybe that's what made life worth living, worth fighting for. We'd face whatever came next together. Changed, but still us. Still fighting to stay human in a universe that made no sense. And maybe, just maybe, we'd find a way to make our own rules. Our own meaning. In this weird, wild universe we call home. The end, or just the beginning? In a universe with no rules, who can say for sure? Frankly, they were as surprised as we were when a Terran colony ship first detected the telltale signs of civilization upon translating into the system. The news was broadcast to every corner of our fledgling interstellar civilization. The parties were wild. The parades shook every street in every city on every planet and moon across two dozen stars. Finally, after centuries of searching, we had found alien life. I remember that day vividly. I was stationed on the Icarus, a science vessel orbiting Titan. The atmosphere in the control room was electric, everyone's faces glued to the hollow screen as the images from the colony ship's long-range sensors came through. There, nestled on the fourth planet from a sun-like star, was an undeniable sign of intelligent life. Structures that could only be cities sprawled across continents, lights glittering like a web of diamonds against the darkened half of the planet. The mission changed instantly. Our orders redirected us to the new system, now designated Hesperia, 
The Icarus, once dedicated to exploring Saturn's icy moons, became the vanguard of humanity's first contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. The journey took us a month in hyperspace, a month filled with equal parts excitement and anxiety. We trained relentlessly, preparing for every possible scenario, every conceivable reaction from our alien counterparts. As we approached Hesperia, our long-range sensors began to pick up more details. The cities were vast, interconnected by what appeared to be an intricate transportation network. Energy readings were off the charts, suggesting a highly advanced civilization. Yet something seemed off. There was no sign of activity, no spacecraft in orbit, no signals or transmissions that we could detect. Our descent to the planet was tense. We landed on the outskirts of one of the largest cities, a sprawling metropolis that stretched as far as the eye could see. The architecture was unlike anything we had ever seen. A beautiful amalgamation of organic and synthetic design. Structures that seemed to grow out of the ground like living organisms. But as we set foot on the alien soil, a chilling realization dawned upon us. The city was abandoned. We spread out, our teams exploring the empty streets and silent buildings. It was as if the inhabitants had vanished overnight, leaving everything behind. Vehicles sat idle, shops and homes were fully stocked, and yet there was no sign of life. No bodies, no evidence of struggle or disaster, just emptiness. Our initial excitement turned to unease. Questions buzzed in our minds. Where had they gone? What had happened to them? We delved deeper into the city, hoping to find answers. The buildings were a treasure trove of technology and information their system still active, waiting to be deciphered. As the days turned into weeks, we began to uncover fragments of their history. Hesperians, as we called them, were indeed a highly advanced species. They had achieved feats of science and engineering that we could only dream of. Yet their records abruptly ended a few decades ago. There was no indication of what caused their sudden disappearance. The deeper we dug, the more questions arose. What had happened to the Hesperians? Where had they gone? And most unsettling of all, why did it feel like we were being watched? The initial thrill of discovery gave way to a grim determination to solve the mystery of Hesperia. The more we explored, the more unsettling the city became. Our sensors picked up strange anomalies, fleeting shadows on the edge of detection, inexplicable energy fluctuations. It was as if the city itself was alive watching us, waiting. The silence was oppressive. Every footstep echoed unnaturally. Every whisper seemed amplified. The architecture, once awe-inspiring, now felt sinister. Buildings loomed like silent sentinels, their smooth, organic surfaces reflecting our own unease. Our team was divided into specialized units. I was part of the tech team, tasked with deciphering the Hesperian technology. Their data systems were unlike anything we had encountered before. An intricate blend of biological and mechanical components. We worked day and night trying to unravel the secrets encoded within their databases. One evening, while sifting through a particularly dense cluster of data, I stumbled upon something disturbing. A series of logs fragmented and corrupted, but still partially readable. They spoke of a great project, a bold attempt to transcend their physical forms. The Hesperians were on the cusp of a monumental breakthrough, something that would elevate their entire civilization to a new level of existence. But then, the logs abruptly stopped. The last entry was a frantic, barely coherent message warning of unforeseen consequences, a terrible mistake. My heart pounded as I relayed the information to my team. What had they done? What could have gone so horribly wrong? Our commander, Captain Harris, ordered a thorough investigation. We scoured the city for clues, piecing together the fragments of their final days. It was slow, painstaking work, but gradually a picture began to form. The Hesperians had created a network, a vast interconnected system that linked their minds and bodies. It was meant to be a utopia, a place where consciousness could exist free from the constraints of the physical world. But something had gone wrong, terribly wrong. One night, as I was poring over the data, I felt a chill run down my spine. I wasn't
wasn't alone. I turned slowly, my flashlight cutting through the darkness. There, just beyond the reach of the light, was a figure. For a moment I thought it was one of my teammates, but then I realized with a jolt of terror, it wasn't human. The figure was tall and slender, its form flickering like a malfunctioning hologram. Its eyes, or what I assumed were its eyes, glowed with an eerie, unnatural light. I froze, unable to move, my mind racing. It didn't seem hostile, just curious. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, it vanished, leaving me shaken and breathless. I reported the encounter to Captain Harris. His face was grim as he listened, his fingers tapping a nervous rhythm on the table. We're not alone here, he said finally. Whatever happened to the Hesperians, it didn't end with their disappearance. As we delved deeper into the city, more sightings were reported. Figures in the shadows, flickers of movement on our monitors, whispers that seemed to come from nowhere. The sense of being watched grew stronger, more oppressive. We were intruders in a place that wasn't meant for us. Explorers in a realm where the line between the living and the dead had blurred. Our mission had become something far more dangerous than we had ever anticipated. The answers we sought were within our grasp, but so too were the horrors that had driven the Hesperians to the brink. The first encounter had left us shaken, but it was only the beginning. As we continued our exploration, the sightings became more frequent, more tangible. It wasn't just fleeting glimpses anymore. These entities, whatever they were, seemed to be growing bolder more curious about our presence. One night, our medical officer, Dr. Sanchez, was working late in the makeshift lab we had set up in one of the abandoned buildings. She was alone, cataloging biological samples we had collected, when she felt a sudden drop in temperature. Her breath misted in the air, and the lights flickered. She turned around, and there it was, a tall, shadowy figure standing in the doorway, its eyes glowing with that same eerie light. Dr. Sanchez tried to call for help, but her voice caught in her throat. The figure took a step forward, its form wavering like a mirage. It reached out, and for a moment, she felt a strange connection, as if it was trying to communicate. Then it vanished, leaving her gasping and trembling. The incident was recorded by the lab's security cameras. We watched the footage in stunned silence, the figure's otherworldly appearance clear and undeniable. Captain Harris ordered a full lockdown of our base, and we doubled our security protocols. But it was clear that these entities could come and go as they pleased. We were at their mercy. Our science team worked tirelessly to understand what we were dealing with. The Hesperians' network, the vast system they had created to link their minds, seemed to be at the heart of it. The more we studied it, the more we realized that the network was still active, still functioning in some incomprehensible way. It was as if the consciousnesses of the Hesperians had been trapped within it, existing in a state between life and death. One day, while examining one of the central nodes of the network, I made a breakthrough. The node was a massive, crystalline structure, pulsating with a faint, rhythmic light. As I connected my equipment, a stream of data flooded the monitors, and for the first time we heard their voices, fragmented and distorted, but unmistakably alive. The voices spoke of pain and confusion, of a failed experiment and a desperate attempt to escape. They spoke of being trapped, of their bodies dissolving but their minds persisting, lost in the endless void of the network. It was a fate worse than death, an eternal prison with no escape. The realization hit us like a hammer blow. The Hesperians hadn't vanished. They had become part of the network, their consciousnesses forever entwined with the system they had created. And now, they were aware of us, reaching out from their digital purgatory. As we processed this horrific discovery, the encounters grew more intense. The figures became more defined, their appearances more frequent. They weren't just observing us anymore. They were trying to interact, to communicate. We heard whispers, in the halls felt cold touches on our skin, saw faces in the reflections of our monitors. Our situation was becoming increasingly untenable. 
Morale plummeted. Fear took hold. Some of our team members began to show signs of psychological strain. Their sleep plagued by nightmares. It was clear that our presence was disturbing whatever fragile balance existed in this haunted city. Captain Harris made the difficult decision to call for an evacuation. Our mission had shifted from exploration to survival. We needed to leave before we became part of the network ourselves, before we too were trapped in the endless void. But leaving wasn't going to be easy. The entities seemed to sense our intentions, their attempts to communicate becoming more desperate, more forceful. The city, once silent and empty, now felt alive with the restless spirits of its former inhabitants. Our decision to evacuate set off a chain reaction that we couldn't have anticipated. As we prepared to leave, the entities grew increasingly agitated. Their presence became oppressive, almost violent. Equipment malfunctioned, strange noises echoed through our camp, and the once empty streets seemed to pulse with a life of their own. One evening as we were packing up our gear, a sudden surge of energy knocked out our power. We scrambled to restore it, working by the dim glow of emergency lights. In the chaos, one of our engineers, Peterson, vanished. We found his equipment scattered on the ground, his tools lying abandoned, but there was no trace of him. A search party was organized immediately. We combed the area, calling his name, our voices bouncing off the alien architecture. Then we heard it, a faint, panicked cry for help coming from deeper within the city. We followed the sound, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. We found Peterson in one of the central plazas, standing rigid, his eyes wide with terror. Surrounding him were dozens of the shadowy figures, their forms flickering and shifting. They seemed to be trying to communicate with him, their gestures almost pleading. When we reached him, the figures backed away, fading into the shadows. Peterson was in a state of shock. It took hours to calm him down enough to speak. When he finally did, his voice was barely a whisper. He described a feeling of being pulled, as if something had taken control of his body and led him to the plaza. He said the entities were trying to show him something to convey a message, but he couldn't understand it. His experience shook us all. It was clear that the Hesperians were desperate to communicate but their methods were terrifying and incomprehensible. We were running out of time. Captain Harris expedited the evacuation, but the process was slow. We had to transport our equipment, secure our data, and ensure everyone's safety. As we worked, the city seemed to close in around us. The structures, once awe-inspiring, now felt like a maze, their organic forms twisting and turning, trapping us. The shadows grew thicker, the figures more numerous. Our sensors picked up strange energy readings, spikes of activity that defied explanation. Then, the unthinkable happened. One of our shuttles, fully loaded and ready for departure, failed to launch. Its systems went haywire, and it crashed back onto the landing pad, a fiery wreck. There were no survivors. The loss was devastating. We were stranded. Our escape routes cut off. In the aftermath, panic set in. Some of the crew wanted to make a run for it, to abandon the mission and find another way off the planet. Others insisted on staying together, believing that our only hope was to understand what the Hesperians wanted. I was torn. Every instinct screamed at me to leave, to get as far away from this haunted place as possible. But a part of me was driven by curiosity a need to solve the mystery that had consumed us. What had the Hesperians been trying to achieve? And more importantly, could we find a way to help them, to free them from their digital purgatory? We regrouped, trying to come up with a plan. Our options were limited. The entity's attempts to communicate were growing more intense, more urgent. We had to find a way to understand them, to bridge the gap between our worlds. But as the days turned into nights, and the night stretched into an endless, oppressive darkness. I began to fear that we were too late. The city's grip on us was tightening, and the boundary between the living and the dead was dissolving. 
Our situation grew increasingly dire as the city's oppressive presence bore down on us. The shadowy figures were relentless, their attempts to communicate becoming more forceful, more desperate. We were running out of time, and the boundary between our reality and the Hesperian's digital purgatory was thinning. One night, as I was sifting through the fragmented data, I discovered something that sent chills down my spine. Buried deep within the network's core was a series of encrypted files, their structure unlike anything I had seen before. It took hours to break through the encryption, but when I did, I uncovered a message. It was from the Hesperians, a final plea for help. The message was fragmented and incomplete, but its essence was clear. The Hesperians had realized too late the catastrophic mistake they had made. Their attempt to transcend their physical forms had trapped their consciousnesses within the network creating a prison from which there was no escape. They were aware, but powerless, caught in an endless loop of pain and despair. The message also contained something else, a blueprint, a potential solution. It was a complex sequence of instructions, a way to interface with the network and potentially free the trapped consciousnesses. But it was risky, requiring a deep dive into the heart of the system, something that could easily go wrong. I presented the findings to Captain Harris and the rest of the team. The room was silent as I explained the implications. It was our only hope, but it was a gamble. If we succeeded, we could free the Hesperians and potentially find a way to escape. If we failed, we might join them in their digital purgatory. The decision weighed heavily on Captain Harris. He gathered us all in the central plaza the very place where Peterson had encountered the shadowy figures. The air was thick with tension as he laid out our options. We could attempt the interface and risk everything. Or we could try to find another way off the planet. Knowing that our chances were slim, we voted. And the majority chose to proceed with the interface. It was a terrifying prospect. But we couldn't leave the Hesperians to their fate. We prepared the equipment setting up a secure connection to the network's core. I would lead the effort, guiding the process from the outside while Dr. Sanchez and a few others delved into the system. The night before the operation, I couldn't sleep. The city seemed to hum with a malevolent energy, the shadowy figures more restless than ever. I walked through the empty streets, my thoughts a whirlwind of fear and determination. The Hesperians had made a terrible mistake, and we were their only hope for redemption. The next day, we began the process. Dr. Sanchez and her team connected to the network, their consciousnesses merging with the digital landscape. I monitored their progress, my fingers dancing over the controls as I guided them through the complex sequence. At first, everything seemed to be going smoothly. The data flowed, the connections stabilized, and for a brief moment, I felt a glimmer of hope. But then, the system began to react. The network pulsed with a chaotic energy, the shadowy figures converging on our location. Dr. Sanchez's voice came through the comms, strained and urgent. We're encountering resistance. The network is fighting back. I tried to stabilize the connection, my heart pounding in my chest. The shadowy figures grew more aggressive, their forms flickering violently. They were trying to protect the network, to keep us from tampering with it. Then, everything went wrong. The system overloaded, a surge of energy knocking out our equipment. The connection was severed and Dr. Sanchez and her team were thrown back, unconscious. The shadowy figures vanished, leaving us in a stunned silence. We had failed. The network had rejected our attempt to free the Hesperians, and now, we were more trapped than ever. Our hope had turned to despair, and the city's grip on us tightened. Failure hung over us like a suffocating shroud. The network had rejected our attempt to free the Hesperians, and the shadowy figures had grown more restless, more aggressive. Our situation was bleak, and morale was at an all-time low. Dr. Sanchez and her team eventually regained consciousness, but they were shaken their minds haunted by the brief connection with the network. They spoke of a vast, chaotic void filled with whispers and shadows, a digital purgatory where the Hesperians' consciousnesses were trapped in eternal torment. Captain Harris called an emergency meeting. 
We gathered in the central plaza, the weight of our failure pressing down on us. The city seemed to close in around us, its structures looming like silent sentinels. The air was thick with tension, the shadowy figures watching from the periphery. We need a new plan, Harris said, his voice strained. We can't stay here, and our attempts to interface with the network have only made things worse. The team exchanged worried glances. Our options were limited. We had one shuttle left, but it was damaged, its systems unstable. Repairing it would take time and resources we didn't have. And even if we could get it working, there was no guarantee we could escape the planet's oppressive grip. We have to try again, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. The network is the key. If we can find a way to communicate with the Hesperians to understand what they need, we might be able to help them and ourselves. The others looked at me with a mix of skepticism and desperation. We were running out of time, and the shadowy figures were growing more aggressive. We had no choice but to take the risk. We spent the next few days repairing the damaged equipment and refining our approach. I worked tirelessly, trying to decipher the nuances of the network and find a way to establish a stable connection. The shadowy figures watched us constantly, their presence a constant reminder of our precarious situation. As we prepared for the second attempt, the city seemed to pulse with a dark energy. The structures creaked and groaned, the air filled with an unsettling hum. The shadowy figures grew more agitated, their forms flickering violently. On the night of the operation, we gathered in the central plaza once more. The atmosphere was tense, the weight of our task pressing down on us. Dr. Sanchez and her team connected to the network, their consciousnesses merging with the digital landscape. This time, I took extra precautions, stabilizing the connection and carefully guiding them through the sequence. The data flowed, the connection stabilized, and for a brief moment, it seemed like we might succeed. Then, the resistance began. The network pulsed with chaotic energy, the shadowy figures converging on our location. Dr. Sanchez's voice came through the comms, strained and urgent. We're encountering resistance again. The network is fighting back. I tried to stabilize the connection, my heart pounding in my chest. The shadowy figures grew more aggressive, their forms flickering violently. They were trying to protect the network, to keep us from tampering with it. Then, everything went wrong. The system overloaded, a surge of energy knocking out our equipment. The connection was severed, and Dr. Sanchez and her team were thrown back, unconscious. The shadowy figures vanished, leaving us in stunned silence. We had failed again. The network had rejected our attempt to free the Hesperians, and now we were more trapped than ever. Our hope had turned to despair, and the city's grip on us tightened. In the aftermath, we regrouped, our spirits broken. We were trapped in a haunted city, surrounded by restless spirits and an impenetrable network. The boundary between the living and the dead was dissolving, and we were caught in the middle. Our only hope was to find another way to communicate with the Hesperians, to understand their needs and find a way to free them. But time was running out, and the city's grip on us was tightening with each passing moment. Desperation had settled into our bones, each failed attempt at communication with the network deepening our despair. The shadowy figures were no longer mere flickers in the periphery. They were constant companions, their presence a chilling reminder of the Hesperians' fate. We were running out of options and time. Our supplies were dwindling, and the oppressive atmosphere of the city was taking a toll on our sanity. The network remained a tantalizing enigma, its secrets just out of reach. But we couldn't give up. We had to find a way to understand what the Hesperians needed, to free them and ourselves from this digital purgatory. In a final desperate move, Captain Harris decided to take a different approach. We would go deeper into the city, to its very heart, where the network's core was located. It was a dangerous gamble, but it was our last hope. The journey to the core was harrowing. The city's architecture twisted and turned. The path
pathways shifting as if the structures themselves were alive. The shadowy figures grew more aggressive, their forms flickering violently, trying to deter us from our path. As we approached the core, the energy reading spiked, and the air grew thick with a palpable tension. The central structure was a massive, crystalline tower, pulsating with an eerie light. It was here that the Hesperians had concentrated their network, their consciousnesses trapped in a digital labyrinth. We set up our equipment, preparing for one last attempt to interface with the network. This time, we would go all in, connecting directly to the core. It was a risky move, but it was our only chance. Dr. Sanchez and her team connected to the core, their consciousnesses merging with the digital landscape. I monitored the process, my fingers dancing over the controls, trying to stabilize the connection. The data flowed smoothly at first, the connection holding steady. But then, the resistance began. The network pulsed with chaotic energy, the shadowy figures converging on our location. Dr. Sanchez's voice came through the comms, strained and urgent. We're encountering heavy resistance. The network is fighting back. I tried to stabilize the connection, my heart pounding in my chest. The shadowy figures grew more aggressive, their forms flickering violently. They were trying to protect the network, to keep us from tampering with it. Then, something extraordinary happened. The chaotic energy of the network suddenly coalesced, forming a single, coherent entity. It was massive, a towering figure of light and shadow, its presence overwhelming. It spoke, not in words, but in a torrent of emotions and images, a desperate plea for understanding. Through the connection, we glimpsed the Hesperians' final moments, their hope and despair as their grand experiment went horribly wrong. They had sought to transcend their physical forms, to achieve a state of pure consciousness. But the network had become a prison, trapping them in an endless cycle of pain and confusion. The entity conveyed a single, desperate message. They needed release. They needed us to shut down the network, to free their trapped consciousnesses. But doing so would be incredibly dangerous. The energy release could destroy the city, and possibly us along with it. Captain Harris made the call. We would do it. We had come too far, and we couldn't abandon the Hesperians to their fate. We prepared to initiate the shutdown sequence, knowing it could be our end. The process was chaotic, the network fighting us every step of the way. The shadowy figures grew more frantic, their forms flickering violently. The entity watched, its presence a constant reminder of the stakes. Finally, with a final surge of energy, the network shut down. The core went dark, and the shadowy figures vanished. The city fell silent, a profound stillness settling over it. We had done it. The Hesperians were free, but the cost was high. The energy release had caused massive structural damage, and our equipment was fried. We were stranded, with no way to call for help. In the days that followed, we scavenged what we could hoping against hope that a rescue team would find us. The city, once a place of horror, now felt like a tomb, a silent memorial to the Hesperians' hubris and our own determination. Weeks later, a Terran rescue ship arrived. We were weak, but alive, our mission a bittersweet success. We had freed the Hesperians, but at great cost. As we left Hesperia, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had only scratched the surface of the mysteries of the universe. The shadowy figures, the network, the desperate plea for help. It was a reminder of the perils and wonders that lay beyond our world. Our journey home was somber, the weight of our experiences heavy on our hearts. We had ventured into the unknown, faced the horrors within, and emerged changed. The memory of Hesperia would haunt us forever, a reminder of the thin line between discovery and disaster, between hope and despair.